Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming here and very welcome at the Interactive Pass Conference number two, because we two years ago there was the first one. Uh, we'll look a little bit more at that later. Uh, before we do, um, I'm a part of this beautiful institution, uh, and this is one of our um, management team, uh, Tom de Smet, who also would like to welcome you because we're very excited to have you here. Over to Tom. Thanks, yes, sir. And welcome, everyone. Yeah, as he said, on behalf of the Netherlands Institute of Sound and Vision, I'd like to welcome you to this beautiful, colorful box that you're in. I'm not sure to, for whom was it the first time you were here? Oh, okay, wow. That's, well, welcome, special welcome. Um, if we had known, we had provided cookies for everyone, but there's some downstairs. Um, actually, this beautiful box hosts, uh, houses an institution that um, has existed for only 21 years at least officially. So it's a very recent uh, heritage institution. The collections, however, have come from four different institutions that merged in 1997. And um, it, currently it hosts a primarily audiovisual collection, um, mainly broadcast oriented. But I'll come back to that later. Um, this beautiful box, Host, I mean, you, when you walked in, you saw it consists of three parts. Um, now we're in the, the part where that, host, uh, that houses the museum and functions like this. So that's for the general public to come and look at the collections, to visit the, museums upsta the museum upstairs, which today is closed, but tomorrow it will be open. Uh, so you, I think you're welcome to go, go in and have a look. Um, then the atrium, so the public space where you walked in, you walk over the canyon, the canyon, from the canyon you can see the bridge over the canyon, you can actually see the vaults where all the audiovisual collections are deposited, including the digital archive, which currently consists of um, 16 petabyte of data here, and then 16 petabyte on a mirrored uh, storage vault um, outside Hilversum. Um, Behind the glass, that's the third part of the box, there's more than 300 employees and volunteers working every day to create value with our collection. Um, and we do that for five different target audiences. Besides the general public who also visit the museums, we also provide online platforms for them. But beside the general public, we also uh, cater for media professionals, be it documentary makers, producers, directors, and so on, to encourage them to actually use our collections in modern day audiovisual productions or broadcast productions, or any production for that matter, even games, perhaps. Um, and then we also cater for, um, for teachers, schools, um, with educational platforms. We have researcher platforms, and we also work together very closely with fellow heritage institutions, which we um, we, try to c we try to link our collections so that the general public can actually look through audiovisual collections, but collections from, different, from a different nature um, without too much hassle. This is basically what people expect these days. And we also, give them, we also provide the infrastructure for smaller institutions that don't have the means or the resources to actually preserve their digital collections, their digital audiovisual collections. So back to that collection that we have, Sound and Vision, it's more than one million hours of audiovisual content. And audiovisual content, that's basically what the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision was known for, because it was the National Audiovisual Archive. But we've become a lot more than that, because we realized that audiovisual, up until 2000, was it, there, were, there weren't many heritage, institu heritage institutions or memory institutions that had huge audiovisual collections. Um, and audiovisual was something difficult, it was something specific to archive, it was, it was, it was expensive, it was very often on um, analog carriers. And, but nowadays, I mean, audiovisual is everywhere. It's in libraries, it's in, it's in, it's in local archives. It's, so you don't need a specific audiovisual archive anymore. Audiovisual is no longer a unique selling point for a heritage, heritage institution as ours. So what we've been trying to do in the last couple of years, in the last decade actually, is to broaden our horizon and not just focus on the broadcast content, which no longer is media these days, is really broad. So if we want to reflect what media culture really is and the impact of media culture, 
we had to look further than the broadcasters. We had to look at uh, documentary makers. We had to look at commercial broadcasters. But we also had to look further than that. So there was also the event of interactive audiovisual media, games. I mean, a colleague of mine on the media park here once said that basically we have to cover everything that um, is screen time. So screen time is basically what we try to capture. That's, the, that's, what we want to, that's what we want to reflect in our collection. So games have become, thanks also to my colleague Yesa, become a really important uh, part of um, that broadening the horizons of the national institution that we are. But I want to give the word to Yesa to explain you further how we got to this point and where we are now when it comes to game archiving. So once again, I'd love to wish you, I, I wish you, you have a fantastic two days here at the National Institute of Sound and Vision. Uh, I saw the program, it's super dense, it's super interesting. I unfortunately can't attend it, but I wish you really a lot of fun, both here and at the social events in Amsterdam. Have a good day. Thank you, Tom. And we'll release you to your other appointments. Um, yeah, before I dive in a little bit deeper into um, what we've been doing with, uh, with our games uh, archive, because you might be wondering, so why are we actually here today uh, in this particular building? It's because we love games. Um, but before I do that, it's not every day that we get a, a, like a, um, a group of people like this with such a varied background. So I just want to know in terms of like, if you would travel home right now, how many hours would it take you to get home? So for those from whom it's less than one hour, raise your hand. Okay, I'm going, just going to guess that's the Dutch people among us. Warm welcome. Um, let's see, um, three hours. Up to three hours. Yes, maybe some people from other countries. Can you, sh where are you guys from? Okay. More than three hours, okay. Um, more than five hours? Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, I phrased the question the other way. So more than five hours, raise your hands. Is there anyone that's more than eight hours? So shout, where are you from? California? California? California. Seattle. Seattle? Santa Fe, we already met. Asia, cool. Very welcome. I mean, it's not every day that we host a conference like this, so we're very excited. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll briefly talk you through some of the things that we've been doing. So it's only been two years since, really, since we've been collecting games, but we've been thinking and talking about it for a lot longer. But it's not one of the things that we, um, we got funded for in the first place, or where, where this institution was uh, created for. But as Tom mentioned, we've started to broaden our perspective on media culture, uh, realizing that everything that we archive doesn't reflect uh, our current media landscape. Um, so we started this research project in collaboration with uh, Utrecht University, who will be presenting, I think, tomorrow, um, and um, got some extra funding, and we started our first games collection. So I remember going out in a little my little Fiat Panda and collecting some obscure games, Dutch computer games from the 80s. And this was mostly our focus, trying to get those early games from the 80s and 90s into, into our collection. We currently hold about 111 computer games and we try to do different things because we realize that game, games are very complex, dynamic objects. So what can we do to preserve those? So this is an overview of some of the things that we do and how we try to evaluate what it, what it means to do some of these things. So um, we try to judge each of these uh, preservation strategies that you see vertically, like are they sustainable, how scalable are they, how accessible to a general audience, what is the cost of implementation, and so we do all kinds of different like mini projects around these uh, various um, approaches, so what does that look like? So hardware preservation, for instance, is uh, something that we don't we don't have any knowledge about games like to put it bluntly um, of course we have me and some other geeks but um, um, but essentially to fix hardware for the long term it's something that requires a lot of uh, in-depth knowledge of games collections and games hardware which we don't have but fortunately there's a lot of people in the Netherlands that do there's all kinds of collectors um, initiatives, amateur collectors that know this stuff. So we've been trying to build a network of um, 
of these communities and try to engage with them. So some of the pictures that you see here, none of that is ours, but during exhibitions we can use it because we build these relationships with these various groups and we try to facilitate them to be more outward focused with their collections. Um, so another approach is emulation, uh, which as you might know is very complex, but we're, tr we're trying to follow along on the state of the art. And we're co going to be using it in some of these arcade cabinets that will soon be on display, where people can play games from our archives. Uh, we're also testing with online emulation. This is really exciting, where uh, basically emulation takes place in the cloud and for an end user, it's not obvious that you're actually emulating. Um, it's still a bit, uh, you know, we need to work on it, but uh, it's exciting to be a part of that development. Um, apologies for the slide. Uh, documentation is another one of those strategies, and what we've done is with a group of experts, again from that network, trying not to do this on our own, but together with other people, is um, come up with um, a canon, sort of a selection of Dutch computer games that are really worth preserving, either because they were considerable success or uh, had some sort of um, they're, they're a good illustration of a trend in, uh, in the development of computer games. And so we'll soon publish this, unfortunately it's not online yet, but as a, an interactive timeline where people can leave their own memories about these games or related games. Um, and by doing so, also hoping to give a bit more of a face to game history. Uh, documentation also for us means to, again, not on our own, but together with other people write on Wikipedia. This is a list of all the, um, all the games that are in the games canon. And this, these are all the um, uh, Wikipedia articles that they have. This used to be a red list, which if you're um, familiar with Wikipedia, a red link means there's no article. There's only two left, and actually, as of a week ago, I checked, it's, they're also blue. So we now all of a sudden have a, uh, um, some documentation that's online available to people. Um, another thing that we did, and we presented on this uh, a lot more so you can find it online, uh, is making Let's Play videos um, with museum visitors, but also with uh, creators. These are two creators from the uh, game developers from the 80s, and trying to interview them whilst they're playing their own game, um, which adds a lot of information to these, uh, these games themselves. And then another strategy that I'm a big fan of is reinterpretation. It's not always possible to preserve a game itself, but what else can we do with these games also to keep them alive and to keep, make them available to a new audience? Um, this thing that you're looking at is um, uh, Fiat Panda. Again, I, I see a theme uh, from the 90s, and it's um, basically um, a fairground ride. And you play a game from our archive uh, from the 2000s uh, called Vacancy Razor, Holiday Razor. Uh, it's a terrible game to be fair, but it's become really fun because what we did, we kind of made an escape room on wheels. So essentially you're driving along in the game, you're being paused at various times, uh, the car breaks down, you have to figure out what's going on, and in augmented reality, the passenger has to get some instructions about what to do, and together you have to solve the puzzle and then you can keep driving. And it's quirky and it's weird, but people love it, and it's a way of keeping these games alive. Another thing that we're looking at now is doing a, a live performance with a uh, DJ where we have Jazz Jack Rabbit, which we have claimed as Dutch cultural heritage because there's one of the main developers is a Dutch guy. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, he's going to live make a new score to the game. Um, this is not all um, finished yet, finalized, but uh, this is definitely something we want to do in the next year or so. So just to give you a bit of an overview, I, I think in, within two years, that's, that's quite a lot that's actually happened. And sometimes I feel a bit overwhelmed by everything that we need to do. But then there's moments like this, and we look back, and we look at the people who are present here and all the things that we're going to talk about in these two days. And I get really excited, and I'm like, yes, we're on the right track. Uh, so thank you so much for coming, and if you have any questions about what we do, please come and find me in the breaks, um, and I want to now hand over to the wonderful people of uh, the Value Projects, that by the way, can I have a round of applause for them, because they've been amazing. <laughs> yeah, because this is hobby for them, I hope you realize, and... Um, <coughs> And they're doing an amazing job. And two years ago, we had the first conference, so maybe they'll talk about it a little bit. But uh, I uh, was allowed to present there even before we had started our games collection. We were very happy and that you were <laughs> like, these guys from the Institute of Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and now look, at, look where we are. So uh, thank right. you so much for being here, and have a great time.